Welcome back to Music 239, Introduction to World Music. Today we continue our study of African American music by picking up where we left off with Amazing Grace. Uh, we've listened to two different versions of Amazing Grace in our last session that are on your CDs. One sung by an African American congregation in 1970s, the other sung around the same time uh, by an Anglo American congregation in Virginia. And we noted the differences and similarities between the two. Uh, they are both singing the same original tune, but significant differences between how the two are handled. Uh, you can certainly apply the African American characteristics that we've studied in this course to the version performed by the Detroit congregation. Yeah. So all of these are important characteristics that are going to find their way into religious music of the African American community in other ways as well. Certainly the influence of spirituals has an effect here as well, and when we hear our guest lecture by Dr. Payne, uh, we will be hearing more about how the spirituals influenced the African American styles that we know today. But I want to get back to Amazing Grace for a minute, because your text has a very interesting transcription underneath the one from the congregation in Virginia, there is one that, is has, that there is a transcription in your book that has shape notes in it. Shape notes are a very important part of American religious society that I'd like to show you about. And this is actually sort of a side note because it's not specifically African American, it really is more European American. But the African Americans who went to church when, uh, during times of slavery learned their music from this particular source, and it's important sometimes to go back to source material. If you look at the transcription in your book of Amazing Grace, you'll find notes in which some of the pitches are different shapes. Can you see that? Okay, take a look at that. Some of the notes are in the, sh in the shape of a circle, as you would normally expect, but then there are others that are shaped like diamonds and some of them like triangles, okay? And uh, lots of different shapes for every note. Has anybody run into that kind of style before? Have you seen shape notes? If you look at old hymn books, sometimes you'll find them. Does anybody uh, have experience with that? Yes, okay, okay, some of you have had experience. So how does it work? How, do, how does shape notes work? Okay, so people who can't actually read music can tell what pitch it is by the shape. How do they do that? Does anybody know? Rote. No, it's not rote. It's not rote. What it is, for those of you that have been in ear training class, is solfege. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. You remember the sound of music? Remember Do a deer? They sang do, do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, okay? Well, each one of those syllables has a particular function in music. And in a shape note system, each one of the shapes is a different syllable. So Do will have a different, uh, do will have a different shape than Re, Mi, and Fa. And there's a couple of different systems. One of them is a four-note system that repeats itself, and the other is actually a seven-note system. But what you are seeing here is a way that people who don't read music can learn to sing these songs just by knowing which of those syllables, do, re, mi, and fa, goes with which shape. And they learn that from the time that they're little kids. And so when they get to their church congregations later on, they know how to do this without actually being able to read the lines and spaces. I know a congregation around here that is like that. Uh, if any of you have any associations with the Mennonites and the Mennonite community uh, in Seymour, Missouri, just east of here, uh, you will find that many of their congregation do not read music, but they all read shapes. They all read shape notes. And so as a result, if you attend one of their services or if you go to a hymn sing there, you find some very interesting and typical 
uh, Mennonite kinds of practices. First of all, the men all sit on one side, the women all sit on another. Okay, they don't want that distraction during the service. They all wear their uh, traditional uh, dress to their services, uh, but uh, they uh, perform their music all as a group. Everybody sings, everybody reads the shapes or reads music, and it sounds terrific. There is no accompaniment, there's no piano, there's no organ, there's nothing accompanying their music. It's all completely a cappella without accompaniment, and they've been doing this since they were very small, and so they're able to read the shape notes and uh, sing in four parts extremely well. So here is an entire community, a music culture, if you will, that, uh, that, that in which everyone participates and everyone is very good at it. Uh, an entire community of sight singers. Can you imagine that? Okay. Our culture is not like that. Uh, we have trouble, we have to have sight singing class in order to teach people to sight sing after they come to college when they're music majors. These people have been sight singing since they are very small. They don't need a class. They should be teaching the class. Okay, they're, they're an amazing culture. Now, the shape notes then are sung in that way, and that's their function. Uh, so uh, many of those congregations have a very distinctive sound to them as well. I want to play you a recording of uh, a group called the Sa Sacred Harp Singers. Uh, this group was in, uh, recorded in Alabama in the 1950s, and what you're hearing is men and boys singing in three-part harmony from shape notes, and they're singing a song out of their hymn book, uh, and w what's interesting about it is the, the very unrefined style in which they're singing, and you, you hear that in these congregations. Well, let's sing number 186. 186. That's right. So, la, 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 la. complicated polyphonic texture in that music going on, uh, sung by people who don't read music, okay? They just read shapes. Uh, but uh, this is the kind of music that African American slaves were, uh, were, were listening to when they first started making the combination of the blue notes that they were singing in their work songs and field hollers and the religious music to create what we now know as gospel, spirituals, uh, all of these styles came from this combination of these two cultures in very interesting ways. And then it went on to influence jazz, blues, rock and roll, and ultimately became the most prevalent world style that we have today, arguably. So, uh, it's extremely important to follow this movement to its roots and see where all of these features came from as we study these characteristics. Now, back to African American music. Your book uh, spends a good deal of time focusing in on the blues and most of the examples that, that uh, continue in the chapter at this point are blues-oriented songs. So that's where we're going to go next and, uh, and talk about blues styles and blues music. The blues originated in the Deep South and uh, you can certainly trace its origins to the field hollers. Mississippi Delta Blues 
Charlie Patton, Robert Johnson are some of the people that your book mentions uh, as the major influence on the early blues. There are a lot of blues performers that were active throughout the South at this time and uh, making recordings that became highly influential on this whole style. But the blues is more than just music, it's more than just a song, it's also a feeling. I've got the blues, but that's okay. I'm feeling low, I'm feeling bad, something's going wrong in my life, but if I sing about it, then somehow it's going to make it okay for me. So it's a, it's, it's a cultural movement. It's almost a cult following. The people that are blues aficionados are almost like a, uh, like a blues cult because they are very religious about it in some ways. It's a completely pervasive style in our culture. Beyond that, though, it is a form, and there is an actual format that is followed by people who write and perform <coughs> blues, the most common of which is the 12-bar blues format. You could also think of it as 12 measures of music, a bar or a measure typically having four beats. Twelve of them, then, would be a total of 48 beats for the entire pattern to go by. And then that pattern will repeat. This style influenced jazz, rock and roll, country, and on and on. You can see it as the roots to a lot of the popular music that you listen to today. There's an additional form that I want you to know about in addition to the regular 12-bar blues that we'll study, and that is the quatrain refrain format. Okay, uh, so uh, those two variations are the ones that I'm going to want you to know about as far as form is concerned, and we're going to study examples of each. I mentioned the term strophic before. Actually, I mentioned the term strophic in our last session. And what it means is verses. You could also think of it as repetition. Essentially, you are repeating the same 12-bar format, and that verse gets repeated over and over. And sometimes they call them choruses. Sometimes they call them verses. It depends on who you're talking to. But uh, essentially, that pattern keeps coming back with different text each time. Now, there's a couple of different formats that you need to know about. One of them is the verse-chorus structure. And the majority of songs that you hear on the radio today have some kind of verse-chorus structure. There will probably also be some other components in this song, like a bridge, for example. And some of them have something called a pre-chorus whose job it is to get you from the verse to the chorus. So there are lots of different formats, but basically the verse and chorus are the major parts of that piece, are the major parts of that structure, and you hear that in a lot of popular songs today, alternating between one and the other. The other example is the succession of verses or choruses, similar to the ballads that we listen to in our Ozarks study of music. Remember the name of any of those ballads that we studied? How about Pretty Polly? Remember that? Pretty Polly is a ballad, and it is in a structure in which one verse simply follows another as the story is told. So a ballad is structured that way, and in fact, so is the 12-bar blues. Hymns are also structured that way, and if we look back at Amazing Grace that we talked about a few minutes ago, you see that essentially that same verse gets repeated over and over as we have different pieces of text. So that, uh, that con constant repetition of the same material is common to all of those formats. But the blues is what we really want to focus on today. And, and what it did was to combine the blue notes that, and the use of the blues scale that we see in the field holler 
with a three-line format that was performed by performers called uh, songsters who went around singing uh, in various kinds of shows in the early parts of the 20th century, late 19th century. With those two elements combined, the three-line stanza, also known as a strophe, was created and there's an example here on your PowerPoint that you can use as a, as a model for what you're going to be doing later as an assignment. Essentially, the first line repeats, and then the third line adds a sort of a commentary to it. Okay, you'll find that the first, first line here in, in our example, I'm going to lay down my head on some lonesome railroad line. Okay, and then that line repeats. So the second line is essentially a repetition of the first. And then we get essentially the punchline, okay? It's like a joke that has the setup and the punchline. And the punchline is, and let that 515 train pacify my mind. In other words, what? Let the train remember. The train, yeah, he's gonna commit suicide. Okay, that's, that's the solution to this particular problem, as, as sung in this verse. So, so, so blues refrains are set up that way with almost like a setup and a punchline um, to, to where you're, you're setting up a problem and then you are suggesting a solution in this case. Yeah, not a, not a particularly healthy solution in this case, but hey, that's, that's the way the blues is sometimes. Uh, now, the fact that we have the repetition of that line, however, does not mean that we repeat it exactly as it was the first time. In fact, what's going to happen is the harmony is going to change when we move from one, line one to line two. So for those of you in from with a theory background, you'll recognize the Roman numerals that we have in our PowerPoint presentation as one, four, and five. For those of you that don't have a theory background, basically there are three chords that are used in this style. And they have names, tonic, subdominant, and dominant. You could also think of them though as one, four, and five in Roman numerals. Those are the three chords you need to have. So if we were in the key of B flat, our one chord would be here, our four chord is here, our, one, our five chord is here, and our one chord is back here, okay? And so as we move through the 12 bar blues format, Okay. What's happening here is that, you, uh, is that the, the, the PowerPoint display you have is showing two bars for each chord. So we start with the voice singing two bars, and then we have a fill for two bars. So you're going to sing, I'm going to lay down my head on some lonesome ro railroad line. That's two bars. And then we get two bars of fill. Now, what's, what's going to fill? What's gonna, what, how does that work? What do you think is going to create the fill? Guitars, right, some kind of solo, or maybe a one-string diddly bow. Who, whatever your instrumental accompaniment is, that's going to play during those two bars of fill. Okay? Then, we're going to repeat that line again. I'm going to lay down my head on some lonesome railroad line. That gets repeated again, but this time there is a change of harmony underneath. So we have instead of the one chord, the B flat chord, we go to the four chord. I'm going to lay my head on some lonesome railroad line, okay? This time with the four chord, and then it may go back to tonic for the fill or it might stay on four. Sometimes it stays the same, sometimes it goes back. This depends. And then we get to the punchline, right? We get to the third line, 
and let that 515 train and at that point we change harmony again. What do we change to? We change to the 5 chord at that point. So we go up here and then we go back to 1, right? So if we sing through it in a, in a sort of a real simple kind of way, we might have something like, I'm going to lay down my head on that lonesome railroad line. Then we go to the next line. I'm going to lay my head down on some lonesome railroad line. And then go back okay, for fill. And then we go and let that 515 train pacify my mind back to one. Only it's not as simple as I'm making it right here, okay? Because what really happens is they add the seventh into those chords and they make them sound a lot more, uh, a lot dirtier than I'm making it here, okay? You really can't, uh, you really can't do it as well on a piano, I think, as you can on a guitar. And so what I'm going to do is to let the, the people that actually perform blues well do that for me as we start to listen to examples here. But that's the basic format. Now, the first example from our textbook will show you what I mean. And uh, uh, both of the, the first recording that we have is the Poor Boy Blues. And you'll see a transcription of it in your text. Okay, you see the description, the, the, uh, uh, the discussion of this uh, around pages 171, 172 in your text. Okay, if you move there, you'll find the transcription of the text, and you'll also start to hear some of the recording of Lazy Bill Lucas. Now, who was Lazy Bill Lucas? Famous blues artist? Not exactly. Not exactly. Who, who is Lazy Bill Lucas? A jazz pianist. Okay, and also composer. composer. Played, guitar. Played guitar. And he performed blues, right? So not so much jazz, but blues. There is a, there is a distinction that, that we're making here. Yeah, he's a blues performer, and, he, uh, and, and the reason he's in the book is not because he's a great blues artist but because he is a typical blues artist. It happens that the author of this particular section of the book uh, performed with Bill Lucas back in the 60s and 70s, and so he was able to use his material in the text and not be under copyright, and that's one of the reasons that it's here. But the other reason is that while there are fabulous blues artists that are represented here, uh, and some of which are discussed uh, in your text, like Robert Johnson, uh, Howlin' Wolf, some of these very, very famous people, B.B. King, who uh, is often here in Springfield, and you can hear him perform quite a bit. Uh, these are great and very famous blues artists. Lazy Bill Lucas is not a great and famous blues artist, but he is typical of ordinary people trying to make a living as a musician playing blues, and that's why his, his music is here. Now, looking at the Poor Boy Blues, you can see in the transcription of the text that in your text is on 172, I'm just a poor boy, people, I can't even write my name. Just a poor boy, people, I can't even write my name. Every letter in the alphabet, to me, they look the same. So the setup and the punchline as we saw it before in this case, the 12-bar blues format is followed pretty specifically. And I think you can follow the chart that we had in our previous slide along with this piece and see what I mean by the format. Uh, let's take a look at this and listen to a bit of this and go back and look at the diagram of the blues form. and see if we can see how it matches up.
Now, a couple of things that you should notice as you start counting measures and working through here is that Bill Lucas doesn't exactly change chords where the diagram says he should. Okay? Do you notice that? Sometimes that five chord comes a little later than you think it should come. Or the change to the subdominant, the four chord, it comes a little later than you think it might come. Because what he's doing is delaying that chord until he reaches a particular point in the text when he wants to make the change. And it's a little different every time. Improvisational sort of chord changing going on here, okay? So be aware of that as you compare the diagram here to the transcription. Now, what happens when he gets to the sections called fill on, the, on, your, on your form diagram? That's when the guitar, right, the lead guitar plays solo at that point. Mm -hmm. And you get those little, those little uh, uh, solos going on. What particular notes are being played when the guitar solos happen? Got a lot of triplets going on, okay. What about the pitches? Where are they coming from? From the blues scale, yeah, from the blues scale. And particularly, the flat seven, you see a lot of that going on. And as you listen to the harmonies going on here, that, that flat seventh scale degree, and I'm going to go back and show you the blues scale again so that I can point that out specifically. If you look at that blues scale, we started on C and we, and we went to a B flat before we came up to C. That flat seven, that B flat there, is a note that is being used a lot in Bill Lucas's uh, fills and also some of his vocals as well. So that's a very important note in the blues. In fact, those chords that I played you earlier, I went one, four, five, one. When in fact what really happens in the blues texture is that they add that flat seventh to all of the chords. So instead of just the straight triad that I played before, what you really get is you get a major minor seventh chord, the flat seven, here on the one chord, and then you get it again on the four chord, you get it again on the five chord, and then you go back to the one seven again. And so what happens is that you get that flat seven on all of the chords. And so in essence, the, the dominant function of a, of, a, of a major minor seventh chord becomes non-functional in that way. It becomes a coloristic kind of sound. Okay, that's, that's for the music majors out there. Now, uh, it, it, the, that, that information is not going to be on the test, but I wanted to make sure that you were aware of the fact that you're dealing with a fairly coloristic use of the major minor seventh chord in this situation. Just be aware then that what we're looking at here is the use of the blue scale, both in the singing and also in the fill, as you keep going through this particular example. So, Poor Boy Blues, then, is a good example of which format of blues? 12 bar. 12 bar. Yeah, that's the standard 12 bar form. Let's listen to another verse before we move on. Hear that flat seven? Now we go to four. Back to one. Five. Then we go to four and then to one. And then we get an instrumental verse. 
you notice how in your blues diagram, the last four bars go to the five, the dominant, for two, for two measures, and then come back to the tonic. But in the performance that you have by Bill Lucas here, he actually goes to four before going back to one. He has one bar of five, and then he goes to four and then to one. If you're listening carefully, you'll hear that there's actually more chords. And that is a variation that you hear a lot in blues, is coming back to four before you go back to one. So be aware of that one. Uh, be aware that any kind of a form diagram you, you make is like putting a round peg in a square hole. I mean, the, the, the problem is that with any kind of folk music or, or blues or anything that involves any kind of improvisation, the minute you try to put something down and say, this is the way it is, then there's going to be 10,000 versions of it that don't do that. And, and that's the way analyzing form is. It's, it's, it's very much a hit or miss kind of thing. All you can do is take an average and say, well, this is what it does a lot of the time and then point out the interesting variations that the artist has done to make it his own so that it's a little different. Okay, any questions so far on this form and on this style? Am I, am I blowing anybody away in terms of using the terms like the one, the four, the five, and the subdominant and all of that stuff? Okay, everybody good? Okay, great. Talk to me if you have questions about that. What I want to do next is to talk about the 12-bar quatrain refrain stop time form, which is the other blues format that we are uh, working with. You'll find a diagram of that in your text if you turn ahead to the text for She Got Me Walking, which is the next track on your CD, also by uh, Bill Lucas. What I want you to look at with this text is how it is different from the three-line, 12-bar blues format that we saw in the earlier song. In this case, there are four lines of text called a quatrain that basically lay out the story. And then there is a refrain, which you could think of as a chorus. You could think of this as a verse-chorus kind of structure. As it turns out, uh, it's generally referred to more as a refrain, and so that's why we get the terminology quatrain-refrain. But this format is one that is very prevalent in not only the blues, but also in early rock and roll. Let's listen to how Bill Lucas does it and how it works in his performance. Now, everything you've heard so far is exactly like the 12-bar blues format that we've already studied, right? 12 bars long, the first verse is repeated, goes from tonic to subdominant. The whole structure is exactly the same as what we saw. But that's just the refrain. Now we're going to hear the quatrain, which will make this form distinctively different than what we had before. My baby told me one day I laughed and thought it was a joke She says, I'm going to leave you You don't know me no more She got me walking All up and down the street She left me Me, boy. 
And this time when we got to the refrain, they did not repeat the first line. It only got uh, performed once in this particular version. So uh, an interesting sort of combination of the two forms. Uh, but the quatrain is the thing that I really want you to see here because that particular characteristic is going to get carried into early rock and roll. As we talked about in our last session, some of the foundations, the building blocks of rock and roll happened in the mid-1950s when uh, artists such as Bo Diddley and in, in the case that we're going to listen to next, Chuck Berry, took these blues forms, and particularly this quatrain refrain format, sped it up, right, and put a different rhythm underneath it, and all of a sudden we've got early rock and roll. One of the earliest rock and roll recordings was made by Chuck Berry in 1955, and it's called Maybelline. Anybody know this song? You know Maybelline? Okay. What I want you to listen for as you listen to Maybelline is quatrain refrain format, because that's exactly where he got the format for this song. Oh, Maybelline, why can't you be true? You done started doing the thing you used to do. As I was motivating over the hill, I saw Maybelline in a coupe bill. A Cadillac rolling on over. What did we just hear formally in terms of the form? We heard the refrain first, didn't we? Right? And it was exactly the way the Bill Lucas, She Got Me Walking, is structured. We have the refrain at first with the repeated section, okay? Maybelline, why won't you be true? Maybelline, why won't you be true? Okay, there's the repeat, at the end, and it goes to the subdominant. And then it goes to the five chord and back to one, just like the blues does. It's just that it's going faster, and it's got a beat underneath it. That's why the term rhythm and blues was used for a lot of this early rock and roll, because that's exactly what it was, was blues with a faster rhythm underneath it. Then we get the quatrain. Or is it a quatrain? Anybody listen to how many times that line got repeated? It was six. Very good. You were counting. It's got six lines and it, uh, it, instead of four, and we're going to, uh, we're going to hear it again now so that you can go back and listen, because after the quatrain, then he comes back and does the chorus once again. Back to the refrain. Okay. So there's how that transfer happens, and we get the birth of rock and roll through the extension of the blues into a rhythmic format. There's another uh, Chuck Berry song I'd like you to hear that is also in quatrain refrain, and it is a uh, it is an early greasy car classic, okay, called You Can't Catch Me. Does anybody know this song? Okay. I want you to listen to, first of all, it's another quatrain refrain, but listen to the lyrics, and then I'm going to play another song that it um, was very influential on. This is uh, Chuck Berry's You Can't Catch Me. Airmobile, must on me, twas a flight deal with a powerful motor and some hideaway wings. Push in on the button and you will get her seen. Now you can't get me. So what's this song about? <coughs> Anybody listening to the lyrics? They go by kind of fast, don't they? Right. It's a He's bought a really good car, and it, it'll move so fast that no one can catch it. Okay? And so the next verse is going to be about uh, driving on the New Jersey Turnpike and uh, leaving somebody in the dust. Basically, that's, that's, this, car is about, this song's about a fast car. Uh, how did it start? <clears throat> it started with the quatrain, didn't it? Only there were more than just four again because he's listing all the features of the car, 
right? It's got this, it's got dual exhaust, it's got custom whatever, you know, it's got all this great stuff. It, and, and it's just like when you hear people talking about their cars, right? Yeah, it's got an overhead cam. He's got, you hear people talking about cars, it sounds just like this. So he's listing them in the quatrain part of the song. And then the refrain comes up and it goes like what? What does it say? You can't catch me, right? The title of the song is typically the chorus or the refrain. That's, that's a given. In most of these songs, the title is in, ends up being the chorus. And that's what happens when we get to this refrain. Now. This next verse has some very interesting lyrics in it that I want you to remember and see if you can see an influence. New Jersey Turnpike in the wee wee hours I was rolling slow because of drizzling showers Yeah, come a flat top, he was moving up with me Then come waving goodbye in a little old souped up jitney I put That was a pretty long quatrain, wasn't it? <clears throat> Anybody count how many there were? I think there were more like 12. It was, it's a long quatrain because he's telling this whole story about leaving somebody in the dust on the New Jersey Turnpike. Now, did you hear the lyric, here come old flat top? Yeah. Where's that? Have you heard that before, that lyric in another song? You come moving up with me? Here's where it ends up. So John Lennon grabbed a few words there from Chuck Berry, I believe. Um, this song, for those of you that don't know it, Come Together, which is the first song on the Abbey Road LP or CD of the Beatles from 1969. Uh, interestingly, if you listen to Come Together, you find quite a, quite a large influence of the quatrain refrain format. It's not blues, but it's very, very similar, and the structure with those repeated quatrain verses there at the beginning is structured exactly the same way that Chuck Berry did it in uh, in You Can't Catch Me in 1955. So uh, there's a clear influence there that you can work through the blues, through Chuck Berry, to the Beatles, and, uh, and it's really a fascinating thing to trace as you continue to make those connections from one culture to another. I don't think he got in trouble for those lyrics, not that I know of. The next song on your CD from the course is Otis Rush. Okay, the Otis Rush, Ain't Enough Coming In. And in this case, we have the 12 bar blues, but then a bridge has been added to the format. So a slightly different wrinkle on the 12 bar blues format. So what's the difference in the instrumentation compared to what we heard from Bill Lucas? 
Uh, yes, Laurie. Ah, yeah, we have a horn section going on. Uh -huh. What else? There's an organ, right, holding a lot of the harmonies behind the texture. Uh -huh. What else? Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. By by horns, I think uh, it's uh, kind of generally understood that that probably implies saxophones, uh, trumpets, trombones. They they tend to refer to all of those as horns when they uh, in the in this particular style, but you are, you are correct, saxophones are in there as well. Okay, what else has changed? Yes? There's a bass guitar now. Ah, yeah, uh, not only that, uh, the, the, it's, it's amplified in the texture to the extent to where it's one of the most prominent features, isn't it? Right, so when the blues gets into an urban environment, you bring it in from the field holler status and bring it into a more urban environment and particularly with the electrification possibilities of electric guitars and uh, electric bass, then a lot of the features are going to change. We're basically dealing with the same structure here, but the sound is completely different because of the way the instrumentation has been changed and the way certain elements of it have been brought out, such as the, the, the moving bass line that is moving in that sort of motor rhythm that we've talked about before. Now I want to close the, today's session with something completely different, but another major, major influence of the blues on a different style. See if anybody knows this music. Count the measures. One. Four. Now we go to the subdominant. Now to five. Four. One. It's a 12 bar blues. What style is this music? It is swing, which falls into the category of jazz. Right. The specific performance is Count Basie, one o'clock jump, 1936. Okay? But the pattern that's being played is 12 bar blues. So a lot of early jazz in the big bands, like Count Basie, for example, in this case, we're playing 12 bar blues with swing eighths and a faster rhythm, and it turns into jazz and a completely different stream from this same element. But I think you can see that we've moved to rock and roll, we've moved to jazz, we've moved to uh, gospel styles, all coming from that 12 bar blues fo format, one of the most influential styles in the history of music. That's all for today's session. We will continue our discussion of blues in our next talk.